Welcome to episode 34 of Math 1050 College Algebra. Uh, this is a study review for exam number five. This is the last regular exam we have before the final exam, which isn't too far away. Um, let's see, let's look at the, at the uh, list of objectives for this episode. Uh, first of all, for this exam, you should be prepared to solve problems similar to those that have been discussed in class and assigned for homework. You know, we haven't, we haven't worked an example of every type of homework problem in class, so it's important that you do those homework assignments. Uh, you will be needing a calculator on this exam. You remember, uh, what was it, two exams ago, you could use a calculator for logarithms and exponential functions, uh, but the calculator problems will be given on a separate sheet of paper. Uh, and then you'll have to put your calculator away for the rest of the exam. Uh, so be sure to bring your calculator with you. Uh, of course, you won't be able to use notes or use your text on this test. Um, any scratch paper that you're given has to be turned in, even the paper that you don't use. And uh, finally, we encourage you to show your work to justify your answers so you can get partial credit. As a matter of fact, there are some problems where if you don't show any work, you wouldn't get any credit because uh, the work is so important. Um, now, you know, the material that we've covered for this exam, I think we could divide into three pieces. First of all, there was the conic sections, uh, parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas. Uh, and uh, those three topics go together, and uh, you might think of that as sort of one block of the exam. Then the next portion of the exam is over sequences and series, and uh, we've been talking about, uh, in particular, arithmetic and geometric sequences and series. And then finally, we talked about uh, annuities, uh, present value of an annuity, and uh, then computing the, the um, uh, monthly payments or the regular payments uh, if you're installment buying. There are some formulas there that you'll, you'll need to know. So if you think about studying for this exam, there are three major blocks, and uh, we'll be go going over some of these ideas uh, today, but I think it helps to sort of distinguish between those three, those three portions. Okay, let's, let's look at sort of a short review of episode 28. Let's bring up the next graphic. This is a, sort of an abbreviated list of items from episode 28. I wouldn't go strictly by this list, but I think these are some of the key points that you'll need to know for this, for this exam from that very first episode. And that first episode was on uh, parabolas. Now you remember, parabolas, ellipses, and hyperbolas are all called conic sections because they can be formed by taking cross sections of a double cone, and if you cut one of the cones uh, parallel to one of the edges, you get, a, you get a parabola. However, the way we've investigated parabolas from, was from a different point of view in episode 28, and that was to look at it on the Cartesian, look at parabolas on the Cartesian plane. Uh, and so this first item of, is, a, is significant to that definition. You should know that points on a parabola are equidistant from its focus and its directrix. Now, you know, the focus is a point and the directrix is a line. And uh, if, I, if you'll come to the green screen here, let me just remind you that um, on the xy plane, if I pick a point uh, above the origin uh, at coordinates 0, p, and if I pick a line parallel to the x-axis, p units below the x-axis, this would be the line y equals negative p. Then when I draw a parabola, that every point on the parabola, let's say we pick this point right here, this point x, y, uh, the distance to the focus and the distance perpendicular to the directrix, those two distances are the same, and that's the, that's the beginning of our discussion for the for parabolas. Now, now, the second item here under our list of topics from episode 28 is to know two standard equations for a parabola. And these are the two standard equations that involve, that involve whether the parabola opens uh, up or down or if the parabola opens left or right. Uh, for example, uh, the equation for a parabola that opens up or down is x squared equals 4py. This is the same p that, where, that we use to locate the focus in the directrix. And these parabolas, if p is positive, will open up. So this is for p greater than 0 and it'll open down in the case that p is less than zero. On the other hand, the equation y squared equals 4px is the equation of a parabola that opens left to right, and it'll open right if p is positive, and it'll open left if p is negative. So you should be familiar with those two equations and be able to solve problems that involve those equations. For example, let's just take a problem right here while we're on the green screen. Suppose I wanted to graph the equation 
uh, 2x plus y squared equals 0. Well, the first thing I need to do is put it in standard form. That's to isolate the square. So I'll write this as y squared equals negative 2p times x. And if, I, if you compare that with the equation y squared equals 4px, that tells me that 4p is equal to negative 2. So if 4p is negative 2, then p is equal to negative 1 half. And because I have a y squared in the equation, that tells me this parabola opens to the right or to the left, and p is negative, so it opens to the left. So right below this, I'll just say opens to the left. And that means that when I go to graph it, I'm going to find my focus on the negative x-axis. And so the focus will be at the point negative 1 half 0. So if this is negative 1 and this is plus 1, then the focus will be at negative 1 half right here. And what about the directrix? Well, the directrix will be a vertical line on the other side of the y-axis. So the directrix will be the line x equals positive 1 half. So I'll just draw the directrix coming through right here. And the vertex, of course, is at the origin, unless we've shifted the parabola off the origin. We haven't had any transformations in this equation. So the parabola opens uh, to, the, to the left, like so. Now, when you draw your parabola, if you, if you don't draw it uh, accurately enough to make it, uh, say, a little bit narrower, if it should be a little bit wider, as long as it's reasonable, we won't take off for this. So uh, you just want to make sure that it passes through the vertex at the origin, that you've located the focus, and you've located the directrix. And right here, I might label this as x equals 1 half. And I'll just put an f on top of the focus point, because there's not enough room to label the coordinates. We have that labeled um, over here. OK, let's go back to our um, list of topics uh, under episode 28. OK, now you should also be able to sketch the graph of a parabola when given its standard equation uh, and give its focus and directrix. I guess, we've just, uh, I guess we've just done that. And then the last item here is to be able to find the equation of a parabola when given information about the parabola, such as its focus or its directrix. OK, well, let's take an example of that here. Suppose we said that the focus for a parabola was at um, 0, 3. And suppose we said that the vertex was at the origin. So given this information, what is the equation of this parabola? Well, I think what I would do is draw an illustration of this. You know, a lot of times drawing a picture, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if we locate this information in a graph, I think we can kind of get our bearings. The focus should be at 0, 3. So I'll put the focus right here. We'll put a little f beside it. And uh, this is 3 up here on the y-axis. And the vertex is at the origin. So that tells me that this will be in standard form. There hasn't been a transformation involved because we haven't shifted it off of the origin anyway. Uh, and that means the directrix then should be 3 units below the x-axis. So the directrix should be Right, right across here. This would be the line y equals negative 3. Now I ask you, do you think when you draw this parabola, should it be fairly wide or should it be fairly thin? And the answer is that it, it should be a rather flat, wide parabola because the value of p is relatively large. You see, this is the point 0, this is the point 0 p, so p is equal to 3. And uh, because the parabola opens up, this is going to be of the form x squared equals 4 p y. And uh, if I substitute in p equals 3, we have x squared equals 12y. So this is the answer that I would be expecting to see on your paper for the equation of this parabola. But if we go a little bit further, you know, we could write this as 12y equals x squared if I turned it around. And if I solve for y, this says 1 12th x squared. Now, thinking back to what we saw very early in this course, when you put a 1 12th in front of one of our fundamental functions, what that does is to compress it. And a 1 12th is a major compression. So this is going to be a very wide parabola. And the parabola is going to open, open up, but very, very slowly. And you see points on the parabola, say if I pick a point right here, is the same distance from the focus as it is from the directrix, if I've drawn it properly. So this looks like this is a rough sketch of the graph x squared equals 12y. 
And again, I'm writing it in the standard form for a parabola as a conic section, whereas down here, I've written it as in standard form uh, for a transformation that is a compression of a fundamental graph. So, uh, but this is, this is the answer that I'd be looking for on the test. Okay, now, there are a few things that aren't on this list. If we, if we go back to that list one more time, uh, there just wasn't enough room to write everything down about parabolas that you need to know, but let me just point out a few other things uh, that you don't see listed here, but if you go to the website, you'll see these things listed, and that is you should be able to uh, graph a transformation of a parabola that's um, been shifted left or right or up or down. Uh, also, you should know about the reflective property of a parabola. So let's talk about both of those things quickly here on the green screen. Suppose I wanted to graph uh, this parabola. Let's say it's uh, x minus 2 squared equals negative 4 times y plus 1. Well, you notice this is a variation of the standard equation x squared equals 4py. Uh, because there's a negative 2, uh, there, there's a 2 subtracted from the x, that means the graph has been shifted to the right 2. And because there's a plus 1 added to the y, that means it's been shifted down 1. So the vertex is no longer at the origin, but it's gonna, we're going to go over 2 and down 1. So that tells me that the vertex is going to be at 2, negative 1 is the vertex. So let's make a note of that right now. The vertex is at 2, negative 1. Uh, also, let's see, it looks like 4p is the same thing as negative 4. 4p is negative 4. Let's take those arrows out. And that says that p is negative 1. So uh, that means I'll be moving one unit away from the vertex to find the focus. And this parabola opens either up or down. That's a negative 4, so it opens down. So that says the focus is one unit below. So if I go down one more unit, I'll have the focus right here. So when I go down one from the vertex, I'll be at the point 2, negative 2. So the focus is at 2, negative 2. Now, let me ask you, where is the directrix? Well, I'd have to go up one unit from the vertex, and it'll be horizontal, so it'll be right on the x-axis. So this is the directrix. Um, so the directrix has the equation y equals 0. And um, so when I draw my parabola, I'm going to draw it fairly wide because um, uh, for p equals negative 1, I think that's a fairly relatively large value of p. So I'm going to draw my parabola rather, rather wide. But of course, there's no accuracy in this without plotting more points. But that's how I would determine how I would uh, how I'd represent it. OK, so here's an example of a parabola that's been translated to the right and down. Now, finally, the last thing you need to remember about a parabola that's not on the list is the reflective property. And let me just draw a quick illustration of that here, too. Suppose I have a parabola that opens uh, to the right. And let's say its focus is right about here. If you remember, if this were a reflective surface, then if I had light coming in parallel to the central axis, parallel to the x-axis, it would reflect off of the reflective surface and it would come right to the focus. Same thing over here. If I had light coming in there, light coming in here, light coming in here, all of these beams of light would be reflected to the focus. And what's more, if they were all lined up here parallel, and if they all cross, if all these rays of light cross this line at the same moment, they would all arrive at the focus at the same moment. This is the reflective property. Um, now, on the other hand, if this were the back of a headlight on your car, if you put the element of the light right here, then the light which went up and bounced off a reflective surface would bounce uh, parallel to the central axis, and now it would be going out. And this is why your headlights tend to point straight out along the highway. Uh, there is some light, of course, that escapes that goes out here diagonally and misses the end of the headlight. That's why you get sort of an aura of light around the, head, around the main beam, which is going straight down the highway. Okay, I think we better move on to episode 29 and look at ellipses. 
Uh, now, you remember, first of all, that we introduced ellipses when we took a cross-section of the double cone and we, and we cut one of the cones, so we entered on one side and came out on the other, so we got a closed curve and sort of an elongated circle, a stretched circle, and that was the ellipse. Uh, but when we introduced ellipses in, uh, in our textbook, we looked at it from an analytic geometry point of view, and that brings us to this first item in episode 29. You should know that the sum of the distances from a point on an ellipse to the two foci is constant. Let me just illustrate that. Um, if I have an ellipse, and if I have two foc focus points, I won't put a coordinate system on here, but if this is focus number one, and if this is focus number two, then if you pick a point on the ellipse, then the distance to focus number one added to the distance to focus number two, I'll call this distance D1 plus D2, uh, that distance was constant. And when we derived our equation, we call that total distance 2A. So we said that D1 plus D2 is equal to 2A. Now, of course, I'm not going to ask you to derive any of these equations again, but you should know the standard formulas for ellipses. And um, those equations are x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. That's one of the equ standard equations. The other standard equation is x squared over b squared plus y squared over a squared is 1. And while I'm drawing my axes, let me be asking you to think about what's the distinction between how we'll draw these ellipses. Well, you see, in both of these equations, we assume that A is greater than B, and that uh, each of these ellipses has two foci that are located at plus or minus C on its major axis. Well, if the larger value is A, then the larger square of the two is A squared. Whichever variable A squared lies under, that's my major axis. So x is the major axis. That means the foci are on that axis. So if I go out a distance c, and if I go back a distance negative c, so this is the point c0 and the point negative c0, those are my two foci. Then if I go further out a distance a, and if I go back a distance negative a, those are my major axis intercepts. And my ellipse passes through those two points. And the minor axis intercepts on the y-axis are b and negative b. Actually, that would be 0b and 0, negative b. And the relationship between a and b and c is that b squared equals a squared minus c squared. That's the relationship between a and b and the focus, the focus value c. Now, over in the other uh, equation, if a is the larger value, a squared is under y squared, that tells me that the foci will be on the y-axis. So I would go up c and I would go down negative c for the foci, and then I would go up even further to a and to negative a, and those are my major axis intercepts. And uh, so my ellipse will look like this and it crosses the minor axis, in this case the y-axis, at b, and at negative b. Now, there are so many possible problems that you could work here with ellipses that we, couldn't, we can't work examples of each one of these today, but let's take an example of one problem that we might want to solve. Suppose the question is to graph this ellipse, and the equation is uh, x squared over 25 plus y squared over 16 is equal to 1. Uh, suppose I want to graph this ellipse, and along the way we want to decide where are the foci, uh, where are the major axis intercepts, what are the minor axis intercepts, Uh, and what is the eccentricity? What is the eccentricity for this ellipse? Well, let's talk about all these things with this example. First of all, the larger square here is 25, and so that tells me that a squared is 25, and b squared 
is 16. So in other words, that implies that a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 4. And the way I calculate c squared is using my equation b squared equals a squared minus c squared. So we have that 16 equals 25 minus c squared, which tells me that c squared is equal to 25 minus 16, if I juggle the terms around a little bit, and that's equal to 9, so that tells me that c is equal to 3. We'll choose c to be the positive square root, like we did for a and b. Okay, so if I erase this, let me write down c is equal to 3 with this other information. So c squared was 9, and c was equal to 3. Okay, so now we're ready to draw our graph. And the larger square was under the x squared, so I know that the foci uh, are on the major axis, which is the x-axis. So I'm going to go to the right three units for a focus, and I'll go to the left three units. And then I'll go further and find the major axis intercepts at 5 and at negative 5. Now if I go up the y-axis, I'll go up 4, and I'll go down 4. And so my ellipse passes through these four points. You know, these intercepts are sort of equivalent to target points that we saw for our fundamental graphs earlier in this course. So if I locate those four, um, those four intercepts, then I'll draw my ellipse through those. And every point on the ellipse, let's say if I pick a point right here, every point on the ellipse has the property that, it's the, that the distance to the two foci is constant. And the sum of those two distances is 2 times a, and 2 times a would be 10. So the total distance here would be 10 for the length of that, uh, of that string, let's say. Okay, so where are the foci? Well, the foci must be at uh, plus or minus 3, 0. That's this point and this point. What are the major axis intercepts? It looks like that would be at plus or minus 5, 0. What are the minor axis intercepts? It looks like they would be at 0, plus or minus 4. And to find the eccentricity, which we abbreviated by the letter E, remember we don't want to get that confused with our natural exponential number, the eccentricity is the ratio of C over A, and C was 3, and A was 5, so it's 3 fifths, or as a decimal it'd be 0.6. Okay, so uh, there's one example of uh, a problem using ellipses, but I think we're pro oh, we, sh we should mention uh, the reflective property of an ellipse before we go on to hyperbolas. This isn't on our, on our uh, graphic for episode 29, but let me just remind you that in an ellipse, if these are the two foci, that uh, if, you, if the ellipse represented a, re a reflective surface and if we had a light source, at one focus, the light that emanates would bounce off and be reflected to the other focus. Uh, the same goes in case the light goes the opposite direction. It would bounce off the reflective surface and it would head toward the other focus. And even if it went past uh, the, f the second focus, it would be reflected and come back to the other focus. And this was the basis for a whispering chamber that the sound that's, that emanates from one focus will be collected at the other, at the other focus. Okay, uh, now let's go to episode, um, episode 30. Uh, now this episode was, was describing hyperbolas, and uh, I think hyperbolas probably have a little extra information with those two asymptotes that make the hyperbolas a little bit trickier than parabolas and ellipses. Uh, if you remember, we first saw hyperbolas, and we took a double cone, and we cut the double cone parallel to the central axis through the two cones. So we cut the upper and the lower cone, and we got two branches for the hyperbola. But when we uh, investigated hyperbolas from an analytic geometry point of view, um, we said that, as it says in the first item here, that uh, the difference of the distances from a point on a hyperbola to its two foci is constant. So for the ellipse, it was the sum of the distances. Now it's the difference of the distances. So let's draw an illustration of this. 
Um, suppose I have a, per, a, a hyperbola that looks like um, this, let's say. And if I pick a point on the hyperbola, say the point xy, and the two foci, which lie just inside of each, of each branch, focus number one, focus number two, if you take the larger distance minus the smaller distance to the foci, the difference of those two distances is constant, and it's what we called 2a. Now, what's the equation of a, of a hyperbola such as this? Well, the standard equation for a hyperbola that opens to the left and right would be x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared is 1. Now, in this case, a does not have to be larger than b. a and b can be equal, or a can actually be smaller than b. The way I tell that the, that, uh, the foci lie on the x-axis is when I place it in standard form, one of these two square terms is, has a plus in front and one of them has a negative in front. The one that's positive is the one on which the foci lie. That's referred to as the transverse axis. So the x-axis here is the transverse axis. If the hyperbola had opened up or down, up and down, I should say, then I would be writing this as y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared is 1. And I always take the denominator of the positive square term to be a squared. And then the, the, the term that's negative, I'll take that to be b squared. Okay, so let's look at an example of hyperbolas, how I would graph a hyperbola and look at something more specific here. Okay, suppose we have the equation uh, x squared over 16 minus y squared over 25 is equal to 1. And I want to graph this hyperbola with its asymptotes. Well, because uh, the x squared is the positive term, I know that a squared is 16, which means that a is equal to 4. And um, b squared is therefore 25 and so b is equal to 5. Now the equation that relates a squared, b squared, and c squared is slightly different from what it was for ellipses and the equation we want to use now is that b squared is equal to c squared minus a squared. You notice there's a slight difference. I'm placing c squared minus a squared because for hyperbolas c is generally larger than a. And therefore 25 is equal to c squared minus 16. And therefore, c squared is equal to, now if I add these together, I get 41. And so c is the square root of 41. Now, without using a calculator, let me ask you to think about approximately how much is the square root of 41? Like, is it more than 10? Well, let's see. Uh, the square root of 36 is 6, and the square root of 49 is 7. So this must be somewhere between 6 and 7. I would guess it's probably a little closer to 6, uh, but it's, um, it's going to be, I'll, I'll just guess and say it's probably about 6.4, but it, it may be 6.3 or 6.5, but that sounds like a reasonable guess. And you notice that C is bigger than A and it's bigger than B. For hyperbola, C is always the largest value. So when I go to graph the hyperbola, um, I would go out four units. Um, to find a and negative a, and I would go up five units to find b and negative b. And I make a little box right there, and the purpose of the box is to help me draw the asymptotes. And the asymptotes go through, is a di are diagonals through that box, and they go right through the origin. And uh, my foci, by the way, are at plus or minus c on the x-axis. So I'll go out to about, um, we'll, we'll put, I'll just put a c underneath that and a negative c over here. That's, that should be the square root of 41. And my hyperbola goes through its, its uh, x-intercept at 4 and it approaches the asymptote the asymptotes on top and bottom. On the other side, my hyperbola approaches the asymptote as well. 
So this is a rough sketch of the hyperbola x squared over 16 minus y squared over 25 is 1. Now, one of the things you should be uh, prepared uh, to see on any of these conic section problems is what if I draw the conic section and I ask you to tell me the equation of the conic. So given information in the, uh, in the graph, what is its equation? Let's try doing that right now for a hyperbola. Suppose I have a hy hyperbola that looks like this. Um, the numbers here are 4 and negative 4, 6 and negative 6, and my asymptotes pass through. And the hyperbola looks like this. Now there's enough information in this illustration for you to write the equation of the hyperbola that's represented here. Obviously it's not a perfect graph, but there's enough information for us to figure out its equation. Uh, let's see, now this hyperbola opens up and down, so I know that the equation is going to be in the form y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared is 1. Furthermore, I can see that a is equal to 4. And I can see that b is equal to 6. And that's enough information to write its equation, y squared over 16 minus x squared over 36 is equal to 1. Now, there are other questions that I could ask you, for example, where it's foci. Um, and let's see, to find the foci, I'd use the equation b squared equals c squared minus a squared. And that would say that uh, 36 equals c squared minus 16. And so c squared is equal to 52. That implies that c is the square root of 52, which is 2 times the square root of 13. Now, you know the square root of 49 is 7, so the square root of 52 should be a little bit larger than 7. So I'll just say a little larger than 7. Now, what are the coordinates of the foci? Well, the foci should be on the, on the uh, transverse axis. So the transverse axis is the y-axis. So if I go up to 0, 2 square roots of 13, there's one focus. I'll say focus number 1. And if I go down to 0, negative 2 square roots of 13, that would be focus number 2. OK. Um, so one example, uh, one more example of many types of problems on parabolas, or rather hyperbolas, and you need to look at your homework and your notes from the uh, television episode to make sure you're aware of how to work uh, the various problems that come up for hyperbolas. There was a reflective property for hyperbolas that goes like this. If I just draw quickly two branches of hyperbola and put foci inside. So here's focus number one and here's focus number two. Then if you remember, light directed toward one focus is reflected toward the other focus. If this is a reflective surface along the hyperbola. Light that approaches one focus that would normally go to one focus would be reflected toward the other, toward the other focus in that case. Okay. So much for the conic sections. Now, um, that, that's only uh, the first block of material in this exam that's sort of tied together. Now, let's go to the next block of material that has to do with sequences and series. So let's look at episode 31. You should be able to distinguish, first of all, between a sequence and a series. Now, let's just talk about that for a moment. You know, a sequence uh, is just a listing of numbers, like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, where you separate the numbers by commas, whereas a series is a summation of those numbers, such as 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Um, so you want to be able to distinguish between sequences and series because frequently students get those confused in exams and, and apply incorrect formulas at those times. Uh, the second thing is you should know how to find various terms when given the nth term of a sequence or a series. Now, let's just take examples of both of those, sequences and series. Um, suppose I told you that the nth term, I'll say a sub n, is uh, n squared plus 1. And what if you're supposed to write the first four terms of this sequence? 
Now, when it's a sequence, that means we'll separate these by commas. This sequence may go on indefinitely, but we're supposed to find the first four terms. Well, to find the first term, we'd call that a sub 1, the first term. That just means we plug in a 1 for n, and at 1 squared plus 1 is 2, so a 2 goes here. To find the second term, that would be a sub 2. What I do is plug in a 2 for n, and I would get 4 plus 1 is 5, so 5 goes here. Now, let me ask you to think about what are the third and fourth terms. The third term is 10, and the fourth term is 17. What if I were to ask you, what is the 50th term? What is the 50th term? Well, the 50th term would be a sub 50. And that would mean substitute in 50 for n, so that would be 50 squared plus 1. Now, 5 squared is 25. 50 squared is 2500 zero, zero plus 1. So that would be 2501. So the 50th term is 2501. Okay, and again, this sequence may continue beyond that. Now, what if it were a series? Well, you know, a series is frequently abbreviated using sigma notation. And what if I were to say k goes from 1 to, uh, let's, let's keep it rather short, let's say 1 to 4, and I'm going to put the, what's called the kth term inside here. Now, the choice of the letter k, you may recall, this is an index, so the choice of the letter k could be another letter like i or j or n. Those are all common letters used for the index. Suppose k were, suppose the kth term were k plus 1 over k plus 3. Now, this question is comparable to what I asked about sequences, but now this is a series, and I know it's a series because of the capital sigma, or a summation here. So what I'll do is write down four terms, but the difference is I'll be adding these up. So when I plug in a 1, I get 2 over 4, which we reduce to be a half. And when I plug in 2, I get 3 over 5. And when I plug in 3, I get 4 over 6, which we can reduce. And when I plug in 4, I get 5 over 7. Okay, so this reduces to be 1 half plus 3 fifths plus 2 thirds plus 5 sevenths. Now, to finish this problem, we need to add these up. Well, the common denominator needs to have a 2 in it. It needs to have a 5 and a 3 and a 7. You know, these are all prime numbers, so the common denominator is going to have to have 2 times 5 times 3 times 7. It has to have all those in it. Now, the numerator, well, let's see, we already have a 2. What I need in the numerator is a 5, a 3, and a 7 to cancel out with the extra 5 and 3 and 7. So 5 times 3 times 7 plus the numerator for this fraction. There's a 3 already. I'm going to put in a 2, a 3, and a 7. That's going to make it 2 times 3 squared times 7. And in the next numerator, let's see, I need to put in a 2, a 5, and a 7. I've already got a 2, so that makes it 2 squared times 5 times 7. And in the last numerator, I have a 5. I need to put in a 2, and a 3, and a 5. That'll make it 2 times 3 times 5 squared. Now, how much is that going to be? Well, let's finish this up above so we don't have to erase that. It looks like the denominator is going to be 10 times 21. That's 210. And here we have uh, 21 times 5. 21 times 5. That's 105. And then we have uh, 9 times 7 is 63. 63 times 2 is 126. And then we have 4 times 5 is 20. 20 times 7 is 140. And then we have 6 times 25 is 150. So altogether, 
this is going to be 290. And if I add on 105, 290, 395, 495, 521. 521. I don't believe that reduces. So I'll leave it at that and say the answer is 521 over 210. Okay, that's the summation for this series right here. It involves quite a bit more arithmetic than that first example did for, this, for the sequences. Okay, let's go back to our graphic and look at other things you need to know about sequences and series. Uh, let's go to the third item. You need to be able to determine a reasonable formula for the nth term when given several terms. That is, if I were to write down the first, second, third, and fourth terms, I would have some sort of a pattern in mind, and I'd want you to recognize the pattern that I have in mind and write down a formula for the nth term. Um, you had some problems like that for homework, but let's move on to the next item. Know how to find terms of a recursive sequence. Let's take an example of that, a recursive sequence. Suppose I told you that the first term of a sequence was equal to 2, and that for each subsequent term, a sub n was 3 times a sub n minus 1 minus, uh, minus 2. Now this is for n greater than 1. So you see this first, uh, this first term gets it started, a1 is 2, and then for subsequent terms in the sequence, a sub n is 3 times its predecessor minus 2, 3 times the previous term minus 2. So let's write down the first uh, five terms of this sequence. Now we're given the first term, we're told that it's 2. How could I find a sub 2? Well a sub 2, a sub 2 would be 3 times a sub 1 minus 2. But I know that a sub 1 is 2, so 3 times a sub 1 is 6. 6 minus 2 is 4. So this number will be a 4. To find a sub 3, this is 3 times the previous term, a sub 2, minus 2. That'll be 3 times 4, or 12, minus 2 is 10. Okay, now let me let, ask you to be thinking about what should be the next term of this recursive sequence. Well, we'll be taking 3 times the previous term, that'd be 30, and then subtract 2 would be 28. And to find the next term, I would take 3 times the previous term. Now let's see, 3 times 28 is uh, 84, I believe, minus 2 is 82. And so it goes. So uh, this sequence continues for all we know, and these, this looks like these are the first five terms of this recursive sequence. Okay, let's go back to that graphic and look at the next item. Um, you should be familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, primarily because this sequence comes up in a number of other courses, in particular in biology, the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, it's a recursive sequence in which the first two terms are both 1, and each term after that is the sum of the two previous terms just prior to that. Uh, and if you remember, a number of uh, plants, for example, grow according to the Fibonacci sequence. I mentioned a tree in my front yard, I think, that's growing according to the Fibonacci sequence. It seems to branch uh, according to this pattern. Okay, and. Uh, then finally, you should be familiar with the sigma notation for abbreviating series. I think we've already looked at one example of uh, using the sigma notation, so let's, let's move on to episode 32. Okay, now in episode 32, we looked at two special types of sequences and series, and those are the arithmetic and the geometric sequences and series. So number one, you should be able to distinguish between arithmetic and geometric sequences and series. Let's just talk about this for a minute because it's, it's important that you be able to recognize these so that you can apply some formulas that are coming up here that we'll talk about. Uh, first of all, if you have uh, an arithmetic sequence, The characteristic of an arithmetic sequence is that you begin with a certain term. I'm going to call the first number just a rather than a1. And then what you do is you add on what's called a common difference, a plus d. So I add on d. And then I add on d again, so a plus 2d. 
and then I add on d again, a plus 3d. So when I get to the nth term, I've added on n minus 1d's, a plus n minus 1d. And this is the, this is the nth term right here. Now, for example, an, an example of an arithmetic sequence would be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, etc. And you see in this case, a is equal to 1. And the common difference is 2, because every time I'm adding on 2 to get to the next term, so d is equal to 2. OK, now, what about, uh, what about a geometric sequence? What about a geometric sequence? Well, let's see. Rather than adding on the same term, um, I'll let you be thinking about what's the difference here between arithmetic and geometric. Uh, well, what distinguishes a geometric sequence is you multiply by a common factor or a common uh, ratio. So if the first term is called a, then what I do is I multiply by r, which is the common ratio, then I multiply by r again and get a squared, and then I multiply by r again and get a cubed, so that when I get out here to the nth term, how many r's will I have multiplied by? It'll be n minus 1. It won't be n. A lot of people, a lot of times students write down uh, a r to the nth power. It's actually n minus 1, and that's because we didn't have an r in the first term. We introduced the r's only in the second term. So the power here is 1 behind the position, so it's just n minus 1. Now, if I were adding up these terms, that would make it a geometric series. And similarly, if I were adding up those, geom those uh, arithmetic terms, that would make it an arithmetic uh, series in that case. OK, let me write down a series and ask you, uh, rather a sequence, and ask you whether it's arithmetic or geometric. Uh, the first term is 4. Uh, the next term is uh, 7. The next term is 10. And the next term is 13. So is this an arithmetic or a geometric sequence? Well, this one is arithmetic because the common difference appears to be 3 in all the terms I've written down so far. So this seems to be an arithmetic sequence. It looks like a is equal to 4 and d is equal to 3 because I'm adding 3 on every time. Now on the other hand, suppose we had this sequence. Um, let's say we had 1 and then a half and then a fourth and then an eighth. I don't think this is arithmetic because the common difference, uh, there, there is no common difference. Here I added on negative a half, here I added on negative a fourth, here I added on negative one eighth. Instead, I believe this one's geometric. And it looks like what we're doing is we're multiplying by a half every time. If I take half of one, I get a half. If I take half of a half, I get a fourth. And if I take half of a fourth, I get an eighth. It appears to be geometric. So it looks like in this case, a is equal to one and r is equal to one half. Now, the reason this is uh, important is because of some formulas that allow us to uh, sum arithmetic series and geometric series. Let's go back to the graphic for episode 32. Um, if you look at the third line there, it says, be able to apply either of two formulas to sum an arithmetic series. And then the, for the line right after that is, be able to use two formulas to sum a finite or an infinite uh, geometric series. So let's just look at these formulas. Now, you'll have to know these formulas for the, uh, for the exam. Um, if I'm summing an arithmetic uh, series, such as a plus a plus d plus a plus 2d, and then we go out to the nth term, which would be a plus n minus 1d. Now let's say I call this sum s sub n, because it's the, it's the sum of the first n terms. There are two formulas that will compute s sub n. The first formula is n over 2 times 2a plus n minus 1 times d. The other formula is s sub n is equal to n over 2 times, now what you do is you add the first and the last 
terms together. So I would call that A1 plus A sub N. This is an abbreviation for the first term and for the nth term. I've added the first and last terms together and multiplied by N over 2. These both give you the sum for an um, arithmetic series um, when you know A and D or you know A1 and AN, the first and the last terms. Okay, let's move on to the formulas for geometric series. Uh, for a geometric series, suppose I were adding up A plus AR plus AR squared, and I go out to the nth term, which is AR to the n minus 1. Now, I would call this the sum of the first n terms, or S sub n. Now, if this, if this series terminates with n terms, then S sub n can be computed by the formula A times 1 minus R to the n over 1 minus R, and this is where R is between 1 and negative 1. Oh, I'm sorry, let's see, for a, uh, for a finite series, there's no restriction on R, so this is my formula. However, if I want to find an infinite summation, I'll call it S sub infinity, or I think in the textbook they just use an S, then in that case, this formula is A over 1 minus R, and there is a restriction on R, and that is that R is between 1 and negative 1. So if you have a finite summation of a geomet for a geometric series, you can use this formula regardless of R, except that, of course, R can't be 1 because you can't divide by 0. On the other hand, if you have an infinite series, you can sum it by just taking over, uh, A over 1 minus R. Now, the, the, the proof for these formulas was given in the episodes, uh, previous episodes, but uh, I won't expect you to derive these, and there's not time now to derive these in this episode. Okay, let's go to episode 33. And this is the last episode before we come to our, um, to our exam. And let me just say, first of all, you should know three formulas for this exam. These are the formulas for computing an annuity, uh, for computing the present value of an annuity, and for computing the payment, or what's sometimes referred to as the rent, on a loan. And then you should be able to, you should know those formulas, and then you, sh you should be able to use them to compute an annuity, a present value of an annuity, or the payment on a loan. Now, here are the three formulas that you need to know, and you'll find them in the textbook. Um, if you're computing an annuity, you remember an annuity is basically a sum of money that's collected in an account that uh, is obtained by regular payments plus interest drawn on those payments. And uh, the final amount of the annuity is equal to the rent or the regular payment you're making into the account times 1 plus i to the nth power minus 1 all over i. Okay, now, um, I represents the interest rate per period, which doesn't have to be per year. It could be per month or per day. N is the number of periods over which the money is being compounded. And R is the periodic payment into that account. So, um, for example, if you're depositing $100 a month into a savings account, R would be 100. And I would be the annual interest rate over 12. And N would be the number of years in which the, these payments are made times 12, because that's the number of payments that are being made. Now, to find present value of an annuity, the present value is computed by taking R times 1 minus 1 plus I to the negative N power all over I. Okay, and the, the same definitions apply. I is the periodic interest rate, N is the number of periods over which the money is being compounded, and R is the regular payment being made on that. Now, to find the, um, to find the, uh, the, the rent on an account, to solve for R, if I solve for R in this formula, I get I times A sub P over 1 minus 1 plus I to the negative n power. Okay, now you should know all three of these formulas and you should be able to solve problems that use these formulas uh, using your calculator. Now, this portion of the exam, the problems would be given um, separately from, um, uh, from the rest of the test where you can't use a calculator. 
Okay, now I'm just trying to think of, uh, of any prob uh, additional problems that might help you in studying for the test. And uh, I think there is a problem on infinite geometric series that uh, we, we never did one of these in class, but they were given in our book. We might close with this example. Suppose I have this decimal number. We have this decimal number, let's say uh, 0 0.181818, and the 18 just keeps repeating indefinitely. Now, one of the characteristics about decimal numbers is if the decimal um, either terminates, like 0.5, or if it repeats, like this one's repeating, then it's equal to a fraction. For example, 0.5 is equal to a half. Well, this decimal is equal to a fraction, and suppose we'd like to find out what fraction is it equal to. Well, I can use the formula for the summation of an infinite geometric series to work this problem. Uh, you see, I could write this number as 0 0.18 plus 0 0.0018. That takes care of this 18 and this 18 plus, now let's see, I need to put in the next 1.8, that'd be 0 0.000018, and if I just continue indefinitely, that will represent all of the pairs of uh, ones and eights that are expressed in this number. If I put these in a column and added them up, I would get exactly that answer. Now it looks like to go from this number to this number, what I've done is multiply by 1 one hundredth to get two zeros in here. And if I multiply this by one one hundredth, I get two more zeros. So I'm thinking this is a geometric series where A is equal to 0 0.18 and R is equal to 0 0.01. That's what I'm multiplying by. So therefore S is equal to A over one minus R. This is an infinite series and you notice the value of R is between one and negative one, so I can use this formula. So I get 0 0.18 over 1 minus 0 0.01, or 0 0.18 over 0 0.99. Let me write that a little bit better there. Which is the same thing as 18 over 99. And if I divide by 9, this is 2 over 11. So therefore, this decimal is 2 over 11. Okay, I hope this helps you to prepare for the exam number five, and then I'll see you next time for exam 35.